Tommy from 1039 The Bear, and I'm very fortunate to be with one of the great members of Slipknot, uh, Sean Crahan, a.k.a. Clown. Man, it's great to see you again. Hey, man, what's happening? You know, I, I gotta tell you, man, the uh, Five, the Great Chapter, it's a very powerful record, and I'm very impressed uh, with everything. It takes a listener to ride from that soft intro right into Sarcastrophe. I mean, a lot of people were waiting for this and waiting for it, and with all you guys have been through, it's just an amazing record, and I really think you, you really made the next chapter great. Thank you very much. Um, we, um, oh, that's really kind of you. We, uh, you know, like everybody in life, sometimes you uh, come across some uh, difficult paths. And uh, one thing that's beautiful about Subnaut is even though sometimes um, uh, people and situations in our lives get off on different paths, uh, luckily and spiritually, uh, those paths always align to one greater path. And that path has always presented itself. Um, so, you know, we pulled together after some just tough things and um, just, you know, yeah. our, our tough things, things that we had to deal with. And um, the good news is um, we created a real special thought process for this last album. A um, few of us, you know, it started with Jim in his garage. Um, uh, writing music and then it was Jim and I and the new drummer in LA uh, getting these de demos together and then it was everybody coming in and it, we had an open lab where you could go in and be creative and we kind of uh, the bottom line is with the new situation of what we created was one we took time uh, to actually ask ourselves what we needed and we followed through and um, it wasn't always easy because we were used to the way things used to be and the way things used to be are just ways that we allowed and we weren't allowing certain things to be anymore so we we started a new way and it was a very comfortable and beautiful um, experience with recording being together writing music there was such a vast amount of music being written and taken serious and we knew we hadn't had an album out in six years and we kind of do what we want and we don't want to write anything that is mediocre to, for us and we feel that that's our uh, bond with our fans is that a um, we're gonna write for us and only us and as long as we do that you guys will always trust us uh, because we do what we want you're looking for something to trust and if it took six years it took six years but the bottom line is we feel like we deliver we, we created a circumstance that was special special things came out of it out of a lot of uh, drastic things that were happening in our life and um, you know it wasn't easy but at the end of it we got a great record that we're proud of and apparently a lot of people are uh, love it and we love it and we love playing it um, feels like 99 where we wish we could play more songs. We just keep adding more songs from this album to the set list. And a lot of it is just because of how much crap we've been through and what work it took to make some of these songs. You know, I mean, currently The Devil and I is my favorite to perform. And it's just because of how immersed I was in that song for so long. Um, um, writing it, you know, getting it together, hearing it come along, hearing the first demo from Jim you know, seeing it as a child and then watching it grow. So yeah, it's a great record. We had a great time doing it. Uh, we, we're so thankful for all the support all the fans waited for us, and it's great. We go out there and play now, and there's 11-year-olds, so it's like the old maggots got kids, and they're, they're bringing it, and it hasn't skipped a beat. You know, I mean, if this was 1999, these would, we would just have all these new fans. It's really, it's really, it's a very... We're very lucky. We're very blessed. Don't take anything for granted. But it's, it's a beautiful thing to see that, you know, in six years, that's a high school and a half generation, generational thing. A whole four years of high school went without any slipknot. And a year before or after, six years. And uh, here we are playing. Cycle, too. It's like six, seven you you got to be careful. Anymore, yeah, you got to be careful. Years, you know? And we did it. And, you know, the, it could have just been the other thing. You know, everybody be like, who the who cares you know um, but we still have our uh, loyal uh, people and we look out there and there's all these young kids and it's like it's starting all up again and that makes me happy because that proves that we're more than a band we're a culture and I feel like uh, the world's always gonna need them some slipknot and um, God knows we need a little bit of the world and you know it's all good I really felt that Jim Root really came to the plate too. I mean, the whole band seemed to come together because when I got this record, you know, I didn't want to listen to it with anybody around. 
you know, I wanted to hear this record and that just soft intro and the whole dynamic of the record, it takes you someplace through the whole thing. But uh, I really felt Jim filled some of the voids and, and all you guys just really came together great. And how do you feel about what Jim was doing, you know, as far as when he was bringing in and, and how you wrapped your hands around with, you know, those riffs and everything else? Well, I don't it's know your yeah no it's it, no no I, I no 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 it has it's an I want to start with this you know I try to reinforce this is that back in the day Jim Root was in a band called Atomic Opera all of us opened up for his band <clears throat> so as long as I can remember in the scene and I'm the oldest I'm 45 Jim's right behind me I think he's 43 could be 44 anyway. We all opened up. I met Paul Gray and Andy Rao, the original lead singer. I met them opening up for Jim's band. They were in a band called uh, Vex. I was in a band called Heads on the Wall. So this has always been in Jim's destiny. This is written. This is like, you know, the band, the, the philosophy begins and ends with me in a way. I started the band. I'm a root. I'm the root of the evil of this thing. <laughs> it begins and ends with me with a certain responsibility. No, I can't take credits for the lyrics. I don't want to. I can't take credits for the riffs. But I'm a mentality. So Jim had to join that mentality. And luckily he got to jam with some great guys, you know. The likes of, you know, Joey and the likes of Paul and these kinds of things. And they all jam. They learn things. So now in this situation, Jim stepped up. And, and, you know, a lot of people in that situation might step up for, for themselves and just really try to bring their own thing and really take advantage of the situation. Well, Jim, learning and being, we consider Slipknot the band. When the album came out in Indianapolis, that's where we were. I couldn't tell you the date, but we were in Indianapolis, 1999, fucking OzFest, and some kids went out and bought the album before they came to the show second stage and we were signing our first cds that's when we deemed the band the band that's the nine of us right there so jim joined something that was going for a while but it doesn't matter there were things he had to learn just as we've had to learn about him but he is the band we can't we cannot misconstrue that that no matter what he's still slipknot however He's such an individual and from such a different world, you know, that he learned the ways of everybody that was the not because he himself is the not. And by re acquiring everybody else's sicknesses, here we are, fifth record, and he just steps up and hits a grand slam because he actually has the feelings. You know, anybody can present a song, but to present a song that everybody wants to help make is what a band is about. We live to be in the basement. It's never been as good as sitting in the basement writing the songs for real. It's never been better, bro. I can remember writing Spit It Out and just wanted to play it. And I bet you the first day we didn't even have the whole thing written and we probably played it 24 times. And then the, we, we made a practice. It was supposed to be in two days and we're like, F that, we gotta get this song practices tomorrow. Everybody showed up and uh, we got that figured out and we probably played it 50 times and we knew what we knew we didn't know it was going to change the world we didn't know we were going to get a record deal from it but we're like jesus we broke through something today we wrote something we can hear is special to us and if it's special to us we're going to kick it down your throat so this record is very special um for instance i wrote the first song exix so that's all me now, why I tell you that is the band is so different that the very first day I walked in the studio and I told the open lab guy who is just there to push record, mm -hmm. I said, hey, man, I know we're loading in and everything. It's the first day, but I got this thing since my bro died. Mm -hmm. I got this riff in my head. I got to get it out. I got this 60, 69, uh, uh, $63 in 63. Yeah, it was called 63 bucks for a while. Like I got this $63 keyboard. You know, I know it's the first day. Next thing I know, you know, four hours later, he's like, hey, clown, I got it all mic'd up and ready to go. We're, we're, you know, this is what the open lab is, is right now, light a fucking cigarette. It's not that other room where it's guitar tones for three weeks, yeah, yeah. you know? So I'm like, no, man, you know, and sure enough, man, that very first day I walked in there and I one took it. I warmed it up. We got tones mm -hmm. and he pulled these old John Bonham mics off that was used on when the levee breaks and they were hidden. Mm -hmm. 
and, and back in the studio, and that's where we record. And he got him on there and gaff tape him on this sixty-three dollar <laughs> piece of crap. And I wrote X six, and I played that on. It's like a harmonica yeah, keyboard yeah. with wind. And what's so great is here, Jim's brings all this stuff, and Corey hears that song, and he one takes it, and only adds a few harmonies, and then the band's all like, "Hey, man, like it could be the opener," and you know, in the olden days, you know, it could be a battle for things, but we're just right. so much comfortable, you know. I would have never guessed. I just needed to get that out. Mm-hmm. I needed to get it out, and guys in the band flock to it, and because they flock to it, you know, it's a reality now, and it, it's a it's a smaller cog in the bigger picture. So, point five, the great chapter is a giant canvas with many rooms, with many little paintings, and it's a showing. And like you said, you want to listen to it by yourself because you know, from beginning to end, it's quite a Especially when you, you know, Exix is kind of a, 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 a goodbye. You know what I mean? It's kind of like, here's all this stuff. Yeah. There's a door at the end. You hear the door shut. And then fucking sarcastic comes in. You're like, yeah. you're like, what is this noise? It's a nice little transition. And then all of a sudden, Daw! and you're like, oh, no. And then you're like, yeah. is it going to be cheese? What's this new Slipknot? No, it's a yeah. dun, 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 right? And you're just like, and, it's, and Corey brings that thing. Yeah. And you're like, I haven't heard that in Taylor in a minute. Yeah. And then we go right into AOV, and you're like, Fuck, maybe I should start the fucking album from the beginning. <laughs> That's the kind of record we wrote. And it took, yeah. it took a lot of love and a lot of hard work and a lot of belief and a lot of people... You know, I hate it when people think we're belly aching about all the shit we've been through. You know, we're we haven't been through one thing more than maybe any of you three in this room. I don't know if your parents are alive or you got loved ones with cancer or, or you know, you struggle with drugs and alcohol whatever it is. Everyone around us has got something. So Slipknot's problems are no more we're all Yeah, we're all people. So you know, all I can say is, you know, we're a lot of people and when one little thing bogs down it really affects everybody so one guy in the band can really affect all all families all families you know what you do on your time off the whole deal so we really pulled it together and we decided we wanted to live and uh, we got busy living you know with you directing slipknot videos and working on films and stuff have you ever thought maybe i know you're always doing these feature films and you're working on this stuff but you ever thought of doing something with slipknot you know something like way cooler than kiss meets the phantom i'll tell you it's funny that you say that i'm not even lying you'd be the first one to say it i had um two three nights ago we were in erie pennsylvania and i was 75 percent asleep in my subconscious, which was a real numb state, it was colorful. I remember that. I remember I was in a really safe zone. But I was still 25% conscious, fighting the fan, fighting the pillow, my stray hairs that were tickling me and itching me, making sure my wife wasn't cold. So logistics. But I wasn't like... I wasn't thinking anything already on the logistics. I was just fighting the pillow, fighting the fan. I was in this percentage, but 75 was like, come with me, come with me, come with me. And something had happened in that day that I can't disclose, but something threatened my art, and like every day. And I've given so much of me to the world, like I very rarely win in the way that I need to, in an artistic way. So I must have taken that into my subconscious. So I had this revelation. Now, all good movies, if you know anything about movies, are that a question is asked in the beginning, and at the end of the movie, the question is answered. Period. End of fucking story. Twist and turn. So it's question asked, twist and turn, twist and turn, twist and turn. Climax. Viewers like, oh, shit, I think I'm starting to put this together. I think I'm drawing my own conclusion what I think this is about and how it's going to end. Twist and turn, twist and turn question does the guy get the girl you know yes or no does he want the girl yes or no does he get the girl you know yes he does he likes her and he gets her so i had a revelation about what the movie would be about because i've been thinking about it forever and i'm locked into a very documentary kind of thing and um i've been looking for that question and in that subconscious state and that threat that hit me earlier the two and collide it and because the fan was bugging me mm-hmm. somehow a pinball entered 
And I tilt it, man. I had I had the question finally, after all these years. It was it's been in front of me the whole time, but it's very simple, and it has to be to be a good, to make yeah. me make it work. So I'm putting into a plan actually to give to my manager and say, look, man, this is what I'm gonna fucking make. But the only way it's gonna happen is if I film it. That's the other thing, yeah. because I was outside the bus with a phone talking to my wife in this movie. And you could feel my pain and my sorrow, and you could feel some other things and and what have you. But the trick was was I was in the bus filming me. And that was me telling myself that I have to film the shit. Because no one else knows, man. I am the gatekeeper to the sickness. I know everybody's pain. I know everybody's behavior. I know where they run. I know where they hide. I know why they hide. I know why they need to hide, when they should hide, when they shouldn't hide, what they're hiding from, what they need not hide from, and I can do that for myself. And if I can get that, I can answer a pretty big question. And it will be successful. Successful in the means that anything worth doing is worth doing for money. Because money is what will get it into a theater. It will be what gets it in a DVD. It's what will get it in a Blu-ray. It's what will get it to your house. I don't care about making boatloads of money. I just care about beating the business that the sickness can infiltrate everything and everybody. And you can have it. And you can give it to people that maybe don't want it. And you can say whether you want it or not. Face some fucking some idiot in this band that you want to hate created this, and you fucking need it in your life, whether you think so or not. That's what I'm fucking here to do. Well, tell me about uh, the new flick, uh, Officer Down. You have coming. Officer Down is a story about a cop that gets brought back t uh, to life after 25 years. He's been dying for 25 years and being brought back to life, thrown into the worst circumstances. You know, kick ass and take names. And um, I'm working with a great, great bunch of people. Uh, Joe Casey uh, wrote the comic. Um, I'm working with uh, Skip Williamson and Mark Neville Dean, who created uh, uh, the Crank series. Um, they're mentoring over me. So I had a team of a bunch of great people. Got to make my first motion uh, picture. Uh, I was a PhD in six weeks. I made a Hollywood movie that is going to look like a very, very um, expensive movie because of, I think, just what I bring to shit. And, um, you know, I did it in 21 days. 18 hour days for six weeks. It's the hardest artwork I've ever done in my life. Um, it's awesome. Um, I worked with Kim Coates. He's Officer Down. Lauren Valiz. Valiz, Valiz I think you pronounce it. Uh, Luna from uh, Dexter. Um, great, great people. A lot of fun. A uh, lot of madness. A lot of uh, just insanity. Um, I got to blow my art brain right out of my face and uh, live it every day. And still am living it a little bit. And, um, yeah, it's a dream come true. I'm lucky, I'm honored, I'm blessed. I'm definitely my element. I definitely enjoy it a lot. Uh, I can't wait to do more. Um, you know, I got dreams now of reinventing like Hellraiser and just like getting my head on anything I can get my hands on that maybe I would love. You know, because the possibilities are endless. I could make my own movies, I can make other people's movies, but I mean, like, if someone had a Hellraiser script, and had funding, and I loved it, and let's go. You know, I just did, uh, I mean, it's it's seriously, I burned out, man. I just, I gave all I got. So we really, the aesthetic and the stylized vision, I think people are going to be, you know, hopefully, I, hopefully it's a brush of fresh air uh, for <laughs> everybody, because I'm coming real different. I'm giving everybody a, something that's a little extreme on the art, but nothing that you can't grab a hold of, nothing where I'm like, I lose you where Richard you're like yeah them. you're just like god damn it clown you're taking too much artistic <laughs> liberties to screw us all over I really I'm putting it in the pocket for everyone to enjoy and the kind of I call it like the jank you know I put enough janky clown sauce in it to like change it up like really but I followed the story that was my biggest thing everybody needs to know like I wanted to represent the story that was my first prize was to make sure that it is 
you know, it has justice. That people that are in love with the comic book and in love with the writer watch the movie and go, "Yep, yeah, that was that was the story." And Clown brought the visual and brought these crazy outfits and this crazy way of acting and you know these techniques. So I, I think the world's gonna like it. It'll be out next June, I think. Um, you know, Comic Con, Sundance. Uh, we're not gonna do it this December and shit. We're gonna do it right. Got to get around in the works of uh, getting some cuts and things, and uh, uh, I got to do some music and can do it right we're going to take it to sundance and uh, i'm going to go out and uh take it to theaters and do a little director commentary uh, before maybe watch a little behind the scenes um then watch the show with everybody do autographs take questions after it you know make it an event man you only live once why not i believe in it and Man, it'd be cool to sit in front of people in a movie theater and be asked questions of, like, why this, you know? And, you know, intellectually, artistically, yeah. be able to have a conversation about that kind of art. I love it, so. When uh, when you were coming up, when did you, what was it? Was there a movie or a series of movies that you go, you know, and I love music, but I want to do that, too. I mean, when, when was that? Was there a catalyst or something like that? Clockwork Orange, Star Wars, Empire Strikes Back, Return of the Jedi, Taxi Driver, Deer Hunter, The Godfather, The Shining, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, Island of Dr. Monroe, everything King Kong, everything Frankenstein, everything Dracula, everything Dr. Fibes, everything... Anything and everything old school horror from, you know, I mean, Christopher Lee, yeah. Bela Lugosi, like, the, you know, so yeah, you know what I'm saying? Like movie, movie making, you know, you know no CG. Yeah. The best it would be is in some King Kong thing. You'd have a little fun, yeah. but there were still some big sets. Wizard of Oz, yeah. uh, you know, um, Apocalypse Now. Um, I mean, the list goes on. The Bridge Too Far, uh, Iron Eagle. Um, I mean, it's just the list. I mean, I have so many crazy. And then there's a whole other, like, crazy thing. Like, there's a humor movie, uh, Eat My Dust. It was like one of those movie pre-Fast and the Furious <laughs> craziness. You know, like, then there's all the B-horror movies. Like, It's Alive, Phantasm, all the cult stuff. So I like all, I like it all, man. You know, but I'll tell you, Clockwork Orange changed my life and so did apocalypse now apocalypse now in a more you know character kind of thing and uh clockwork orange on a scenery thing well i tell you what i really appreciate and you're very passionate about what you do and thank you so much for the thank time you, and you. hey the slipknot record really was worth the time you guys took thank you very much